Wonderful. And, and before I turn it over to Ms. San to get us started as our moderator, can you give them a warm welcome for joining us today? Good morning, everyone. Um, hope you all are doing well day two of the summit. And good morning to our panelists. Um, we wanted to start off today um, by actually asking the audience their views on what they would like to get out of this session. Um, and so we have two questions that are meant to come up on the screen um, to get us started um, before we then introduce ourselves as a panel. While we're waiting for the questions to come up, because I always, oh, perfect, there they are. So you have an option. Um, some people love the more creative questions, other people just want to get straight to the point. Um, but you have an option to respond to either of these questions or both. There's a QR code which you can use to then put in your answers. And I will call on folks to share some of their perspectives. But first question is, what are you hoping to learn about collaborations between R1 institutions and MSIs, HSIs, HBCUs? Um, and those collaborations could be research collaborations, curricular collaborations, entrepreneurial collaborations. But what would you like to get out of the session, essentially, in the hour of your, of your life so you're not going to get back? Um, second, for the more creative of those who want to imagine for a minute, imagine that you've just wrapped up a wildly successful collaboration with an MSI, an R1, whatever other type of institution that you are not. Imagine you've just wrapped up this wild, wildly successful collaboration. The team is motivated, engaged, and satisfied with the outcome. Communities and partners in your ecosystem are curious to learn more about replicating what you did. What factors contributed to making your project so successful? What did it take to get there? So almost starting with an appreciative inquiry perspective. What in this, imagine that you've just come out of this project, you're on a high, you were skeptical at first, there were so many differences in experiences, exposures of the different collaborators on this team, you were worried, but somehow it became wildly successful and now you're reflecting on what actually led to this, what was done, one or two of the most essential things that happened as a result. And so while we do that, I will hand it over to our panel. We'll start by introducing ourselves um, and one experience or tool that you have come across in collaborating with a different type of institution, um, something that has worked for you. So I will start with David. Actually, no, I think in our, in our planning, we were gonna start with Magdalena and then David and then Amy. Okay, thanks. And by the way, just letting the audience know, please fill in the poll because we will refer to some of these. We are trying to start from an asset-based orientation where we know that we are just some of the perspectives in this work and the rest of us in this room have many perspectives to share. And so we'll be calling on, on some of the things that you've talked about in the poll in the later half of the conversation. Go ahead, Magdalena. Okay, great. Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm really honored to be part of this conversation. My name is Magdalena Barrera. I serve a couple of, in a couple of ways here at San Jose State University. My main role is that I'm the Vice Provost for Faculty Success. Um, but in addition, I help to lead our Accessible Technology Initiative. I'm the co-chair of our AI Advisory Committee. And I'm gonna throw this in. I'm a co-author of a book that came out last year from Duke University Press called The Latinx Guide to Graduate School. It's a first of its kind guide for Latinx and other historically marginalized students um, to understand what they're signing up for when they are pursuing a master's or PhD. And the reason why I bring that up is because the fourth kind of hat that I wear is leading a team around our HSI initiatives at San Jose State. And so a tool that uh, we have found to be really helpful in these kind of collaborations is um, a, this team of faculty, um, staff, some administrators, and students came together a couple years ago to create a document that we call Somos SJSU. That's Spanish for We Are SJSU. It's an HSI framework specific to our campus. You know, thinking about now that we have HSI status, what does that mean within our particular set of demographics, within our local communities? What are the values and 
uh, efforts that we want to drive from that identity. And it's a tool for all kinds of researchers, collaborators, no matter what your role is at the institution, to kind of think about how do you use this as a foundation for the work that you want to propose. You know, we had found that some um, folks applying for grants were approaching their work with a very deficit-minded view of how they're going to help our students, rather than start from the basis of what are the gifts our students already have and how can research and, and collaborations build upon that. So I'm really excited to see how many of our colleagues have taken up this tool. One of them is Katie Wilkinson, a professor in biological sciences. She partnered with a colleague, uh, Dr. Theon Griffin at UC Davis, to create a program that is building a pipeline of SJSU undergrads and master's students who are prepared to apply to PhD programs at UC Davis in particular, but you know other biological sciences programs, particular to um, their focuses on molecular, cellular, and integrative physiology, um, that particular program at, at UC Davis. So there's three components of their program. Um, one is a mentorship program that pairs SJSU students with grad students at UC Davis who are currently in that program um, who are either graduated from an HSI or who identify as a member of a marginalized um, community within the profession. The second is a workshop series about navigating grad school and what to expect once you're there. Um, that's open to students who are not only mentees in the program but also uh, anyone um, within biological sciences at SJSU who's interested in, in learning this. And then the third piece is a research symposium at UC Davis for the students who were uh, mentees. They get to tour UC Davis research labs, hear from scientists at UC Davis, and present their SJSU research alongside those scholars. And their diversity officer at um, UC Davis was so impressed by what Dr. Wilkinson and Dr. Griffith put together and inspired by the SOMOS SJSU um, document that they, she suggested that they named this effort SOMOS Davis. So yeah, it's been a really great collaboration. Hello. Hey everyone. Uh, my name is David. I'm assistant professor at UC Santa Cruz where I direct the Tech for Good lab. Um, in Tech for Good, we design digital tools for education, work, and communities. And I also have a really big passion for experiential learning. So I have 100 undergraduate students in my research lab in, in student programs where uh, we take students from any prior background as early as first years to learn user research, UI UX design, web development, and AI machine learning in the context of real world research and community projects. Uh, in terms of MSI H, uh, R1 collaborations, my experience is in the context of collaborating on student programs within UCSC and then also with Cabrillo College, um, our local community college, on establishing research pathways for community college students. I also um, do a lot of community engaged projects, which I see as one of the strengths of MSIs that have you know, really strong ties to and a dedication to the local community. Um, in terms of tools and experiences, I'll say two practices that have been helpful for me. The first is to start with small efforts, um, things that don't take too much time for everyone to get involved in. They're valuable for everyone, and they can help foster and facilitate building trust to set a foundation for long-lasting collaborations. Um, and, and second, I found that integrating authentic you know, student learning experiences can also be something that's really, really uh, helpful for, um, for a project. I think beyond just expanding the impact of the project through you know, training the pit workforce of the future, I found that you know, students bring their passions, they bring their knowledge of the programs on campus, the, camp the, the student groups on campus, uh, and that can really help expand the reach of the project. And if you do it, if you set up the uh, learning outcomes uh, experiences in the right way, then you can really uh, tie that learning experience to really uh, advancing the, the real world uh, project goals. Um, and so, you know, these two things have been a really big part of my own journey, uh, trying to kind of bridge the tension between um, academic work, where we, we often in the university context have to uh, generate publications, and wanting to make sure that, you know, even while we have to do that work, um, we are also 
advancing long-lasting value for you know, community partners that we collaborate with. Thank you, David. Um, definitely appreciating this idea of moving at the speed of trust and taking the time to sort of work in smaller projects and, and work your way up to, to larger ones. Um, and also appreciate, Magdalena, the idea of really showing people, you know, you talk about this idea of servingness. It's in the SOMOS SJSU workshop and how, uh, framework and how people recognize the assets based in the teams that they're working with rather than looking at the gaps and gazing at the gaps. Um, please go ahead, Amy. Okay, I think this is okay. Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Dr. Miwa Kwakwame, who's a professor in um, the Department of Earth and Environment Equity and Data Science at Howard University. I lead the data science program, it's a master's degree program, and our PIT work sits in that department. Um, my core futures lab allows students from middle school, high school, undergrad and grads kind of work on tech projects tied to climate. Um, and as we kind of, as myself, think through what's happened this week um, and processing this, um, looking at the question of tools with HBCUs, R1s, and I'll another acronym there, PWIs, um, one tool that um, was, I guess, given to me uh, um, early on when I was starting the program was the relationship with UChicago. UChicago, through the CAN network, which is Capacity Accelerator Network, which is funded by MasterCard, um, was an opportunity for me and other HSIs, MS, um, MSIs, to kind of work together in thinking about building capacity at, at our institutions. Um, and the director of that program at UChicago, um, one thing that I really appreciate about him leading his program, but also working with myself as a new director in our program was the, a, a, a month never went by when he didn't say, Amy, I was talking to this person and I brought up your program name. Or I was talking to this funder and I shared what you're doing at Howard with this funder. So I think when it comes to R1 institutions, knowing that unfortunately some R1s are R1s because they have benefited from the free labor from HBCUs and MSIs and tribal institutions, um, sharing those resources is very helpful. Um, being honest about contributions and sharing authorship of publications or um, in many, many ways when it comes to grant writing, um, not just co-authoring but mixing authorship um, through the CAN network and I was able to um, be introduced to other funding opportunities. Um, David also did a great job in giving me some playbooks, right? giving me documents that he had, that he had um, already on his computer that he shared with me to be able to learn from and adapt. Um, and allow our program to grow. So I think when it comes to tools, just sharing, um, being trustful and co-designing um, and being um, honest about some R1s have been able to be at that level because some institutions have not. Um, and how do we kind of balance those, those, um, those scales as we continue to serve populations, as um, legislation comes to defund schools um, and to ban books, how do we share resources? Thank you, Amy. Um, no, that concept of how do you promote and champion as an ally um, when you are in collaboration, I think is very critical. Um, hi, everyone. So I'm Miss San Rowane, Executive Director of the Stanford Impact Labs, um, which is an accelerator based out of Stanford University. Uh, we are partnering with communities to put social science um, to better use for society. We do that by investing in learning what works when it comes to testing, scaling, designing solutions to social problems. Um, we train scholars, practitioners in how to use evidence and data to harness their impact. And we're generally trying to promote a culture of public impact within higher education institutions. Um, and so was very excited to be a part of this conversation because we recognize that there is so much to learn as an R1 institution and how to create more equitable collaborations um, with partners, be they other higher ed institutions or practitioner partners. Um, I think one tool that I find useful when thinking about collaboration and partnership is really having a clear theory of the partnership. Why are we partnering together? Um, you think about theory of change. If we do X, then Y will happen. For us, we think about a theory of partnership of if I bring X and you bring Y to this partnership and we do Z together, then we will achieve this outcome. And I think being very clear about 
when a partnership is meant to be a one-time, one-off, small project, or maybe even, quite frankly, transactional. Like, we need to apply for this NSF grant and we're gonna be better off if we do it together, um, but for X outcome. And being clear, what are the superpowers that we all bring to the table and why we need each other. Um, I think having those clear conversations, setting the table up for longer term collaborations is just important. We like to talk about real talk. And so having those clear conversations up front is one thing that I've found that's helpful. Um, a few more minutes for the poll. Remember to please fill in your responses so that we can have more fodder for the conversation once we close the polls. Um, as we talk about these experiences and tools that you've just shared, could you maybe talk about one challenge that you've experienced in trying to run these more equitable collaborations with other types of institutions? Well, going back to the Somos Davis partnership between SJSU and UC Davis, you know, there's two minor logistical uh, challenges that the PIs encountered. One was really working between the funding mechanisms of two very different institutions. And so there was a problem, as they say, of how to spend the money. So for example, there were no overheads if the money was spent at UC Davis, but they wanted to pay students at SJSU a stipend. If they wanted to pay that through SJSU, then part of the grant was gonna have to incur overhead charges to be dispersed at SJSU, which they hadn't budgeted for in their overall grant. So their solution was to find a way to pay the SJSU students through UC Davis, but that meant they had to be very nimble in what they um, were requiring the students to do or to put forward. Um, so for example, um, you know, the students could be paid to give an oral presentation, um, but not a poster session, right? So trying to like find in the fine print what, how exactly can we get the money and the stipends into the hands of the students who have signed up for the program and are doing the work. Um, another minor challenge was just, you know, our institutions operate on different timelines. We're on a semester system, UC Davis is on quarter, and that might not seem like a huge hurdle, but really the timing of the recruitment of the mentors, getting the program started, right, students are already several weeks into their work at San Jose State by the time UC Davis gets up and running on the quarter system, that that became a kind of thinking carefully about the calendaring of our events and when students would be available both as mentors and as mentees in the program. Challenges, yes. <clears throat> um, you know, I talked about starting small, taking that long-term view. I think a uh, challenge to that for, for myself um, and I think for a lot of people, is there's a lot of pressure, there's a lot of external pressure, a lot of internal pressure to um, publish faster, maybe generate headlines faster, especially as an untenured faculty. And, um, and I think for integrating you know, student learning experiences, I think it's similar. You know, there's a lot of challenges towards taking that long-term view. Um, it's, it can be pretty consuming, <laughs> especially early on when you're trying to figure out you know, what is the model that's gonna make it, make it work? You, you know, you're putting time to mentorship, coordinating, um, building those structures, and then sometimes there's questions. You know, is the, students are coming and going all the time, so um, how do you do it in a way where the, you know, the contribution student makes are maintainable, they last beyond uh, their time? Um, how have I overcome these challenges? I, I think I'm still working on <laughs> overcoming these challenges, but I've definitely, you know, made some progress. I, I would say that, you know, one thing that has been helpful for me is figuring out how to do research across disciplines. So, um, you know, getting involved in education research makes it so that when I'm working on um, student programs and the time I'm putting into student programs, I can publish about that in an education context. Um, that's, that's something I actually learned uh, in my PhD. You know, we were working with governments. I, at that time, I was doing kind of mathematical work, algorithmic work, and um, and I found, I, I had that tension of, you know, how much is, you know, the, the things that I'm doing, you know, building different platforms, you know, actually going to be publishable. And, and, and looking back, um, I see that, you know, if I had understood design research, that could have been um, something that I contributed to. There's a political science scientist we're working with, you know, she was publishing it in her context. So I think, you know, when you're working on something hard, you generate knowledge. Um, but you have to find the research community that values it. Um, the second thing uh, is uh, finding ways to 
develop student leaders, develop student leadership structures. I think for each of the, you know, for user research, UX design, web design, for each of those th core pillars in, in the projects that I, I worked on, um, I had to start from, you know, putting a lot of time into each one, um, directly mentoring, building the resources, and then passing that on to students who um, were, you know, involved and really stepping up. And so kind of taking time to build those um, upskilling ladders, I think, is, uh, is something that's really helpful. And then, and then finally, funding, I think, is, is something that um, is, is important. I think halfway in, I started to scrape together little pots of money, and that enabled me to put together an executive team of student leaders who could take on these, you know, uh, bigger picture, lo longer time scale types of tasks and, uh, and, and coordination work that, you know, really didn't make sense to have, you know, unpaid student leaders uh, getting involved in. And so I think um, it, it takes some time, but uh, it's been eight years. And then and finally, you know, in this last month, you know, I was appointed to a position as director of research pathways to support other engineering faculty um, and, and given some resources to help support, you know, student leaders longer term. Thanks. Congratulations, David. Congratulations. And thanks for sharing. I think, you know, Magdalena, Magdalena, your point around like navigating the university administrivia to, to get these collaborations done and, and having just the mindset of finding workarounds. How do we just sort of figure out how to get the students paid and everyone on the same planning around the same job? And David, just this point around like getting creative. You have your constraints around, you know, getting published and being upfront and open with the collaborator, your partner, like, hey, what's our plan here? How do we figure out how we publish, you know, even if we don't have the ultimate outcome, like we can figure out milestone publication opportunities and talk about the progress and, and figure out creative ways to, to get funded. So thanks for sharing those, and Amy. Thank you, and I was follow up what Dave talked about. I wanna start probably with the, the rank conversation, the challenge of um, partnering with someone who may not be a, associate or full it is challenging. So being an assistant professor and partnering across institutions is a large time commitment. Um, so how you balance expectations for that partner, um, we have to be very, uh, I'm be, I'm be very sensitive for an assistant professor because they have more burdens, uh, more scrutiny, more review before they get tenure. Um, but even with that, um, at the time I partnered with Dr. Tanya Sweeney, who was in the video, we saw um, she offered me a, a visiting professorship at her lab. Right, and to start, it was just have access to resources, like uh, um, journal publications, um, books, and come visit when you want. You can come, come, you know, uh, uh, you can come to my class, and that was very helpful just to get onboarded with a partnership, um, in talking and seeing what you have, and seeing seeing a fully um, funded lab. Just, um, so that was very helpful in just sharing resources and status in with rank challenges. Um, the second is also risk. Like if there's no risk for a full professor at a R1 to share space or share infrastructure or share lab equipment, that's also very useful for our students. So having our students um, be funded from our side, I think that's easier, but to have access to travel to experiment, um, use lab spaces at an R1 is very helpful. Um, so not ha the, the infrastructure challenge can be diverted um, with shared space and shared labs. Um, and I would say um, the last, uh, another challenge um, that comes up for me, that comes to mind, is along with resources, but just um, with NSF, with um, NIH, sometimes the question of, 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 of lineage. And lineage is what, what is your history with grants or publication that um, partnering with an R1, um, sometimes not having that lineage or not having those connections um, does hurt. But there are ways that partnerships can be, can be made that that conversation can be um, built. Right, so you can agree to be a, either a, co a co collaborator, a partner, a co-PI, PI, like just, co just knowing that the language that we choose to partner um, is, has impacts depending on your rank. But if there's no risk for your rank, it's more helpful to um, consider how to rank the rank to help both sides, if that makes sense. You say just a bit more about that. So you're saying it, I have less risk as a tenured faculty than another, than my collaborator who's not yes. tenured, then how do so, we figure out? So I think if, and I walked through this like a few months ago, if you happen to partner on a project for NSF, 
but you're put down as, a, I think, a collaborator or a partner, when it's posted, you may not see that person's name. Right? So the question is lineage. Like, you may have been working on that project, you may have been getting some funding, but because the hierarchy of how the system uploads abstracts, right, it's hard to defend if you were on that project until someone pulls the whole grant up, right? So I think knowing that for a partnership with an institution that may not have a long history, it is helpful on how you choose to rank collaborations with titles for certain institutions or foundations or grants. Um, if it's no risk, it'll be better to allow um, with wisdom if the professor is an assistant professor, because I think the workload conversation, and um, I want to say something. Um, many times we have higher teaching loads, so uh, our partners will have lower teaching loads, we have higher teaching loads, so I can agree to partner, but my research partnership does not decrease my teaching partnership. Right, so knowing that that's also a time commitment that we have to negotiate, um, but it does help being a co-PI um, for just my, uh, not just my career, but for the transparency of the work, right, and who gets, uh, where the outcomes fall when it comes to communities that are also benefiting. Thanks for that, Amy. That's, that's super, super helpful, and I think the importance of having those conversations, not just at the beginning of the partnership, but very important to have them at the beginning where, where possible and throughout about what are my constraints? Um, what is the risk that I'm taking here versus you? What are my teaching loads? What are my burdens? So that you can really have a strong theory of the partnership. Like if I, you know, supplant some of my responsibilities around teaching to put in the extra time for this project, I need to be named a co-PI because I am trying to build that lineage and, and credibility within the publishing publishing space. Um, so yeah, thanks for, for sharing that. Um, I'm not sure if we've been able to close the poll, but last chance to you know, put in your thoughts so that we can continue the conversation. Um, would be helpful if you could share a piece of advice that you have for folks in trying to build winning collaborations with other institutions. Um, should we switch it up? Maybe we start with Amy and then Magdalena and then David. Um, advice, I think, again, thinking about this week and it being heavy, um, it, it, working together, there's an African proverb that we can go fast by ourselves, we can go farther together, that if we do partner together, there is a sense of higher ed, whether it's under attack today, tomorrow, southwest, east, that we do go farther for our students when we do work together. So partnering, um, even though there are challenges, you have to use certain tools, um, there is extra effort, um, but for our students specifically, uh, there are rewards and benefits that transcend just our unique classrooms. Um, so I would say let's all commit to thinking about ways in which we can allow our classrooms to just not be in our space. It does help, um, particularly students who are maybe in community colleges who don't travel. It does help to have even a travel grant with another institution to have students come from their space to your space. Um, in just experiencing a different um, higher education space. So learning, um, studying abroad, things like that. Um, those are very, very helpful, um, I would say. So I advise everyone to definitely commit to um, allowing our institutions to kind of take students beyond what, where they think they can learn in our own spaces. Well, a piece of advice that I have is, you know, I find myself thinking about a couple of weeks ago, I had the opportunity to be part of a San Jose State team who attended the University Innovation Alliance Conference, really great conference centered on student success um, across the socioeconomic spectrum. And a speaker there shared something that has stuck with me. She said, don't just see what's there, see what's possible. And I love that because I think what that advice calls us to do is to question our assumptions going into a project, into a partnership. And the reason why this resonated with me is because I had an experience several years ago of uh, being a speaker at a conference and before our panel started, I you know, went into the room and I caught the tail end of the previous panel which was about mentorship. And one of the speakers who was talking when I walked in was um, a researcher at an R1 institution speaking to a group that he assumed was also all R1 um, scholars. And as I came in, he was saying, you know, we have to think about mentorship and, and refine our practices so that we can help our colleagues who teach at regional comprehensives and at you know, MSIs and HBCUs, like we need to help them. And I remember just sitting there thinking, 
we can also help you. <laughs> like we have a lot of things that we do day to day that could really transform how things operate at R1s, right? And so just as we are trying to teach students to take asset-based views of themselves, um, so it is that we need to do that with ourselves and institutionally, right? So to not look at other institutions as a deficit of, oh, but they don't have this, you know, and, and we can give them this. Yes, we have things to share, and Amy, I think you made a really important point about institutional reciprocity, right? And to enter uh, into these collaborations exactly with that kind of spirit and mindset. Thanks for sharing. Um, and just before I, I turn it over to David, um, we have a bit of a glitch. I know about 16 folks responded to the polls, and so if you could take a microphone, or I think there's some microphones that will be passed around. Yep, right here, exactly. If you could please come forward just to get ready to share um, some of your ideas, suggestions, um, and as we said, what was a big contributing factor to a wildly successful collaboration. That would be helpful. I was gonna read them out, but unfortunately I can't see them. And so it'd be great if you can come up and actually share so that we can continue the conversation. So if you have a question or a contribution around what you have seen lead to successful uh, collaborations, please come up and get ready to share. David. Okay, so um, advice for starting a collaboration, right? Um, I, I would say find something that you're passionate about enough um, that, you know, that you're willing to invest in, in, in for the long term. Because I think it takes time to, to build trust, it takes time to find alignment, it takes time to kind of build the structures for long-lasting collaboration. Um, you know, there, there really aren't shortcuts to trust, and, you know, there aren't shortcuts to societal impact, in, in my view. I would also say um, having empathy for all the participants, really making sure to, to think about you know, what is the value that they're getting out of the collaboration and, you know, making that, taking that seriously and, and, and valuing that. Creating um, opportunities for students so that, you know, they're not just participants, but they have uh, pathways to step into more responsibility and more leadership, I think, is, uh, are all things that I would, I would say. Thank you, David. Um, yeah, and it was very important to think about institutional reciprocity, as you said, um, but also that trust will take time to build. Um, and so moving at the speed of trust is just one of those sayings that I've, I've always appreciated. I think the, the tensions around trying to, you know, show outcomes, trying to publish, trying to launch curriculum, um, it sometimes means that you sort of move too fast and not everybody's prepared for that, and so important to move at that speed of trust. So thank you all for sharing. Um, any questions from the audience? Um, anyone who'd like to share some of what they put into the poll? Oh, sorry. I have, yep, go I, ahead. Should I stand up? <laughs> Hi, everyone. I'm Katie Kamiski from the City University of New York, and um, I think I was a little surprised about the questions because I, when I read the title, I was imagining, because I'm at the College of Staten Island, which is somewhat rec recently been designated as an HSI, and um, I was thinking more around how can we, across MSIs and HSIs, build collaborations to build our collective strengths. Um, I think we need to, as, as, as the distinguished colleagues on the stage have already mentioned, I think that we need to uh, readjust our measures of success, that it's not around simply how many research dollars one institution can achieve. And in fact, in order to maintain your R1 status, you have to reach a certain benchmark in terms of millions and millions of dollars of funding. So the motivation, that's really the only thing that distinguishes our ones from other institutions. They then associate that with those are the institutions that are doing the most impactful research. But how, what impactful research is, that definition is depending on who's making the definition, right? And if we are um, right now moving into a time where certain priorities are seen as having greater value than other priorities, is it the right way forward for us as a community to aspire to be more like our one institutions who are going to now really try to huddle in to keep their fundings and their status 
versus us building community across folks that are, have similar values um, that may also be doing impactful work in service to the communities that we value so much and that we should then be the ones that are driving innovation, driving change, and also protecting those, of, those students that we know are set up right now to become most vulnerable. So I am just, I appreciate the idea of moving at the speed of trust, but I'm not sure if um, that's even possible, especially in the given context, and that we may have to go inward and, and sort of gather ourselves together because there's going to be massive forces that are going to work against a lot of the values that we in this community, at least I've encountered in this community, hold dear. And I'm not sure who right now is a trustworthy uh, collaborator or who is a trustworthy uh, institutional leader or who's a trustworthy uh, corporate partner, right? And so for us to invest in that is that's gonna be our, our cloak or our hedge of protection around this work, I'm not sure if that's really the answer. So I would love to hear from you guys who have more experience in this. Uh, I can't. Thank you for sharing. Oh, I think it's a very interesting comment slash question. Um, for the need to reach outside of our spaces to be able to do the work we do, is that necessary? Um, I would say no. I think for um, some time we have been doing what we need to do for our communities. Uh, the challenge is, Doing that and not being compensated and valued, um, that's a challenge, right? Um, and knowing that when it comes to federal funding, it's, it's all about tax dollars. So why are we not able to access our own funding to fund what we want, right? And I think the question that's being posed is that are ones that at least have the willingness to say that we know that it's our funds and there is research that shows that some R ones get the same funding without even blinking Right, it's automatic that can, they, can we begin to shift the scales to say that um, we want to partner to be able to balance out because we know who is doing the work, right? And we know that it is not right. And for institutions that have historically gained funding on the backs of individuals, right? How do we begin to shift that conversation? For private sector, same conversation. What private sectors have been receiving funding on the backs of individuals and how can we shift those scales? Right, so I think is can, can we continue to do what we do and not be compensated, valued, or have access to our own funds? I would say no. So it does involve looking across and allowing them to either self-reflect or asking the question, right? But even amongst our own circles between HBCUs and MSIs, we can do more, I believe, working with each other. Um, I think the challenge becomes if it's work working across this aisle, it's even more work working with the least amount of funds we have with ours. So how much effort do we put on either both sides or do we begin to find other ways to um, find resources for our communities that are not tethered to any R1 uh, private foundation? It's just, it's, it's extra work. And then how, how, much, how, long, how long can we continue to work without being compensated just to do the work that we know? So it's a tough question, but I think it's a very valuable question. Because um, it's risky for many of us to even think about trusting um, institutions that have, for historically have not been able to be trusted. And I think part of it, um, you know, I appreciate where you're coming from, right? And you're raising a really um, important point. And I just think it has me thinking to what extent can we build our own networks of, say, HSIs, minority serving institutions, et cetera, right? That, I think about here in California, right, the different kinds of networks there are that meet regionally around being HSIs or meet, you know, if not in person, then via Zoom, you know, virtually to exchange ideas, share what are the latest updates on our campuses, et cetera, right? But it gets tricky because even, you know, that's one thing to do, say, within the California State University system, there's a lot of sharing and reciprocity. But I've noticed in going to different HSI-related conferences in recent years, that are ones that are now becoming HSIs, they like to designate themselves are HSIs, right? And so it's like, why? It feels like, to what extent? Like, okay, that is a different institutional context, but at the same time, are we just replicating the kinds of divisions and hierarchies that are already so prevalent in higher ed that we're trying to push back against? So it's, it's a tricky line to walk, right? And. I don't know, I think about the HSI work on our campus and we're very fortunate 
to now have leadership that really values that work and is centering it in our institutional identities moving forward. You know, in, in prior administrations, there was a longstanding team of faculty, uh, staff, uh, and students who were just on their own accord, kind of doing this own work. You know, the team that created Somos SJSU, like we were just like, got tired of folks coming to us at the last minute and already having their grants set up and then asking us, oh, do you want to be a co-PI? But then we would read the grant and see it's very deficit-minded and what you think you're going to be doing for, say, Latinx students. So we wanted to provide this tool to say, well, here's a foundation, a different starting point, and bring us in from the beginning. How can we help our institution cultivate a com more uh, broader understanding of, of what it means to be HSI or not assume people should know, right? Because that's a journey of learning all on its own. But we just came and did it ourselves, right? And now uh, we're fortunate that it's being lifted up and, and used as a broader tool, but sometimes it is like, the work is meaningful to us personally, and it's not paid, and it's sometimes not recognized, but what is the, th I'm not trying to act like we need to be selfless and, and do it all without recognition, but at the bottom line, there's something that has drawn us to higher ed, and there's meaningful work to do here, and so how do we keep that in, in our hearts despite the disappointments, despite uh, rejections or the hard work, lack of recognition, but this is the mission of what we're here to do, and I'm gonna continue doing it because it's a part of who I am, my mission and purpose in higher ed. David, did you want to share anything? Happy to also um, jump in. UCSC is, uh, is R1 and HSI, <laughs> so I, have, I love the question, but I don't have that much to say here. Okay. Um, no, definitely appreciate multiple points that you made around we can either, you know, one of my mantra strategies is like, you gotta play the game, and then by playing the game, you get to change the game. Um, but I love your point, which is like, maybe we just create a new game. And maybe we don't ascribe to sort of the systems and the hierarchies and what's valued. And we start to collaborate amongst ourselves and change the definition of the game. It shouldn't be about publications. It shouldn't be about who has the most resources. It should be about what solutions have you put into the world with your research that have improved the conditions of people's lives. And if that becomes the game, if that's how tenure is made, if that's who gets published, if that's who gets the resources, like, that's a better world. Um, and so I totally agree with you where there's opportunities to come together around the values that matter. Is this about outcomes on people's lives? And if we're aligned on that, then let's partner. And if we're not, then let's figure out more creative ways to be transactional, play the game while we have to because we have to get paid for our work. We have to build the lineage in terms of publication, history, track record. And then over time, we get to opt out and, and you know, change it and play a whole new game. So yeah, Which, I definitely appreciate um, that also, element of the conversation. I'll also add, I think it's also not, it's not, so out, it's not out of the preview of saying, you are a R1 in my area. I know how you receive your R1 funds. Would you mind just sharing? Like, give me, I'm not doing no much, I'm not, like I'm not doing extra work. Like, I know we got your funds, and I think, um, is it Georgetown that they admitted that some of their funding and endowment was based upon um, please don't quote me on this, um, enslavement, and they agree to fade, how will they begin to redistribute some of their funds to be able to adjust. So I think some of it also is how we even ask some institutions to think about what they have and can they redistribute to support people who don't have without work, right? Like I'm not doing any work. Um, if, let's say, you know, Pell Grants get cut, like there will be institutions that will be hit hard because some of our students are Pell Grant. Can we look for our ones or private institutions to help us continue to sustain our institutions if Pell Grants are cut or if other education funds are cut? I think that's a question that we can ask. They may say no, but I think it's a question that we can ask and we should not, we should not be afraid to ask, knowing the history and what, what is it, what, and what it means to be our one when it comes to resources. I know one experience that we had um, in the past year was an opportunity to collaborate with another institution that didn't have the same level of resources financially um, or the you know prestige that would help make this NSF grant a lot more competitive. And so we put our name as part of the grant, but we didn't add ourselves as an actual collaborator so that the, you know, I think it was, is it 40% that gets, the university has to get to its overhead with partnering funds. with Stanford? We're like, we're not. Quite frankly, I did it because I didn't want to deal with the administrative drama of trying to get that done. Um, but because of that, we, 
we got the grant. Like they did get the NSF grant. We're going to collaborate pro bono. It's not a Stanford, you know, Stanford doesn't get paid from it, but it'll lead to publication. It'll lead to the lineage in terms of NSF. And at least we're able to lend that prestige to help hopefully get the grant across. So some examples of getting creative. Any other questions, comments, anyone wants to share? Please go ahead. I want to share two things. I work at Meharry Medical College. Our president is James Hildreth. Um, he was, had a wonderful career at an R1 institution, and they threw money at him for his research. He's an HIV researcher. Science, you know, his science is solid, hasn't really had an issue with that, comes back to Meharry, can't get anything funded, right? So we know that there's a bias in environment, right? How uh, HBCUs, MSIs, however we want to categorize ourselves, what these funders think about our environment and our ability to do science. So that is a big issue and we have to do something about that. I agree that we need to create something new, but if we're going to the same people to try to get money and they're always going to score us poorly on our environments, no matter what we're doing, you know, we're, we're sort of screwed. Um, but then you kind of talked about indirects, right? Which is sort of the bane of our existence. I mean, um, you know, R1 collaborators in my neck of the woods, right? And I can play nice in the sandbox and I appreciate partnering, right? Their indirect rate is the most ridiculous thing that I have ever imagined. But when you work with community, even the Meharry indirect rate, which is you know, nestled at about 50%, makes it almost impossible to even do the work. So what are people doing around these ridiculous you know, indirect rates that just seem to keep going up, 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 up? And I don't know what you know, administration really wants us to do about that. I'm not interested in writing another grant with a ridiculous indirect, nothing comes back to me, and it just doesn't even leave any money for me to hire anybody to help me get the work done. So I'm just wondering how y'all are dealing with that. Yeah, I, I think, um, like she said, like negotiating. Like before you partner, have a conversation, like would you mind lowering your indirect costs? It is, in some cases, maybe a no, but at least X, right? Or can it be lowered halfway? Or if it's no indirect, um, are the faculty doing in-kind? Which again, in-kind, if you have one teaching load, versus three teaching load, you know, it's, but I think, I think axing, axing, and then I think more foundations are also putting caps, because they're realizing that um, the indirect is going very high, so um, I do ask the funders, like, is there a cap? Because I want the cap, because I need to get the cap down to be able to control. So asking if there's a cap with the, with the giver is also um, very helpful. Um, <clears throat> one thing that, that I did recently in, a, in an NSF grant, um, NSF has a category called participant support, and uh, if you're doing work that is, uh, you know, building student programs, and the students who are participating and you know taking on leadership roles, if you can make the argument that, you know, they are part of their participants in that program itself, uh, then you can. Um, pay them through a budget category of participant support, which uh, in at least at UCSC, I, I think elsewhere too, um, NSF does not allow any uh, overhead on that. So I think, you know, I just put, <laughs> I just put a ton of, uh, like, I don't know, 200,000 of participant support <laughs> into the grant and, you know, just to try to um, increase the amount of student leaders that are paid that can, that can, um, be part of that without that money getting taken away. It makes such a big difference. But yeah, if someone else has figured out any other hacks for getting around these indirects, I, I didn't come from academia. I've only been in academia for the la oh, in an academic institution for the last two years, and so I was horrified when they first told me that 50% would be going. You know, we make grants to our own faculty. We're paying 8%. It's uh, it's interesting. Um, so yeah, any other hacks, we're happy to hear, but yeah. Uh, hi, uh, Vincent Dugson, I'm here at San Jose State. Um, I've worked at a number of different institutions, including a research university um, in Arizona, in Tucson. 
And a couple things uh, bring a little optimism, I think, to the table here. One of which is, when I got here six years ago, the collaborations are already happening, despite institutions, right? In fact, I'm a big fan of not because of, but despite of, often. So if you look around and go, how many collaborations are already happening? They're, they're, they're taking off, they're going on. The real question then is, how do we leverage that institutionally to do more and affect more? The second thing is, agnostic to research one, research two, regional, blah, 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 because those collaborations are happening, and because there are ones that are HSIs, including University of Arizona, where I was for eight years, they've adopted scholarship of engagement, other strategies to think about tenure and promotion. So have we. So where are the like-minded institutions agnostic to whether or not they're at this level or that level? And I think the opportunities that emerge from some of that stuff that happens. But I think if it's a doubling down on the work that's already happened, you're going to find holy cow, there's already a lot going on. The third thing is, I've seen national networks like Pitt UN, like the University Innovation Alliance, other things. We sat, you know, I was with Magdalena, we were in Phoenix, we sat with Michigan State, and we walked away after 20 minutes going, we're both trying to solve the same problem. So how do we think about that? What do we do together? What do we learn from each other? And I do think there's much more learning back and forth. The last thing I'm going to say is, at the same time, sometimes we have an asset that another institution doesn't have. I don't know, I'll pick two in this region. Stanford, San Jose State. We graduate 10,000 students a year. We put thousands into tech co companies at a scale that Stanford's never going to do. So when Stanford goes out and the CHIP Act comes, where is the partnership? Well, we ha are a research university. We're the second largest research university in the Cal State, but we're also a workforce engine. So when the money starts to come in, we go, well, here's an asset you're never going to have at scale, and we're going to work at scale. So how do we partner and bring that asset? And then the effects are the partnerships and other things that go on. So I think these are strategies that allow for these multi-sectoral sorts of projects to emerge across different kinds of institutions. And I think we should credit ourselves, actually, because more of it's happening. And it's actually not because of provosts and other administrators is because faculty and staff and partners at the local. When the institutions get in the way, that's when you really need strategies and other things like that to scale. But I think there is a lot that goes on already and I think we should leverage that and talk about it more openly like we're doing here because it produces models that then people can go, hey, what, how are we going to take advantage of that? Where does that look like it could happen and so forth? So. Just some thoughts about the panel. So thank you. I also want to add one more strategy that I think that was also in um, staffing. I think one thing that is sort of infrastructure staffing that I may not have a large grants department or uh, ten admin assistants, but we can we can leverage staffing to be able to get some work done together. Um, so I'm seeing many ways that um, we partnered also with some R ones and just staffing capacity. Any other questions? If not, okay, yes. So we do have to wrap up, um, but let's end on, like you said, a very positive note. One thing that gives you most hope that you're most excited about when it comes to collaborations in your space, be they research, entrepreneurial, curricular, but one thing that you're most bullish and excited about. Well, I, I feel like um, there, there are more and more funding opportunities these days, I feel, around education and um, you know, funding opportunities at NSF. I, I have uh, struggled initially to get a lot of uh, grants through some of the traditional routes, but you know, in the NSF you know, EDU, EHR um, division, there's really a lot of opportunities that are growing and I think a lot of foundations these days, I think partially because of uh, ChatGBT and people are thinking about how that's going to revolutionize you know, learning, I think there's also a lot of you know, efforts that I'm seeing um, around people wanting to fund different kinds of educational curricular uh, programs. Something that gives me a lot of hope and optimism and joy is really just the students seeing them find ways to bridge their 
home and ethnic identities with their academic identities and doing amazing things in the world. I think us being able to go far in solving problems, whether it's tech problems, health problems, I think the more we work together, um, it just helps us all. So. Um, I, I'm most excited by the intersectionality that we're seeing more and more of in our institutions in this kind of work. The fact that you have folks who are R1s, MSIs, folks who are wearing multiple hats and being in multiple spaces and challenging the conversation. And I'm excited about what could happen as a result. Thank you all for this conversation, for the opportunity. Thank you to our panelists. Thank you to the audience. Thank you, Misan, and everybody on the panel. What a great way to end on the notion of hope. I love it. <laughs>